Alright, lesson 18 is really just mainly a review of complex numbers and also talks about complex functions. Uh, the main new concepts would be the concept of the linear differential equation of order n, both homogeneous and non-homogeneous. And then it's really just a review of all kinds of information about complex numbers, the fundamental theorem of algebra, uh, a little bit of Maclaurin series and stuff, and how that's used to prove some of the properties um, and relationships among the complex number system. The other thing is the hyperbolic functions, hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine, and hyperbolic tangent. The hyperbolic cosine is actually a catenary curve that produces things like your hanging cables and hanging chains and ropes, etc. Uh, all of these concepts really have been covered, all of this review stuff here has been covered in a college algebra course or trigonometry course, possibly a pre-calculus course in the past. So a lot of it should be review. Might need to clean off some of the cobwebs though. So it's good to look over all of that material from the textbook. Other important notes about the textbook, the symbols with the three line segments like this means uh, identically equal to. And if there's a slash through it means it's not identically equal to. And by identically equal to, if you see y identically equal to zero, that means it's the function y equals zero. Uh, if you see y is not identically zero, that means that it's not the function y equals zero. That doesn't mean that y can never be zero. It just means that it is not the function y equals zero. So let's look at, first of all, the definition of a linear differential equation. A linear differential equation is any differential equation that can be put in the form where you have some function f sub n of x times the nth derivative of y plus f sub n minus 1. So these are all different functions of x times y to the n minus 1. And this is the n minus first derivative of y. And then you'll have the n minus 2 function times y n minus second derivative of y on down to eventually you get to f1 of x times the first derivative which is just y prime plus f0 of x times the function itself. You could think of that as the zeroth derivative of y and this is equal to some other function of x, call it capital Q of x. So that's what I'm putting on the right hand side. Now in the case where your second derivative on down is not included, this becomes a linear first order differential equation. You could just take your f sub 0 of x divided by f1, then it fits that form y prime plus p of x times y equals q of x. It says the above ODE is called homogeneous. If your right hand side q of x is equal to 0, and non-homogeneous if your q of x is something other than 0. And the following are just a few examples reviewing the complex number system. Uh, concept of a conjugate. Given the complex number z equals 2 minus 3i, find or evaluate the conjugate of z. The conjugate of z is just 2 plus 3i. The conjugate of a minus b is always a plus b, and the conjugate of a plus b is always a minus b, so that one's not too bad. As far as the absolute value of z goes, if you remember, it came from the Pythagorean theorem. And let me just go over here and actually sketch 2 minus 3i. In the complex number system, uh, all complex numbers correspond to a point in the two-dimensional plane here. Your x-axis is the real line. The y-axis you could think of as the imaginary line. So 2 minus 3i would mean you go 2 out in the real direction and negative 3 in the imaginary direction and you're talking about this point right here. So the absolute value of z, or the modulus of z, is just the length of this line. So if you remember back in trigonometry and in college algebra when we dealt with stuff like this, we just used Pythagorean theorem. This side is 2, this side is 3, so this side right here has to be the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. And so that's what we put over here. The absolute value of z is just the square root of 2 squared plus you could say negative 3 squared if you want but it's still going to be the same as 3 squared so that's 4 plus 9 that's 13 so the absolute value of z is the square root of 13 the argument of z with a capital A just indicates the smallest positive angle having a terminal side that goes from the origin out to your complex number 
And so the argument of Z is going to be this angle right here. Or this is your imaginary number Z. So I need to find that angle. Well first I find its reference angle, which would be this little angle right in here. I'll call it theta. That's my reference angle. Well I know that the tangent of my reference angle is going to be the side opposite, which is negative 3, over the side adjacent, which is 2. However, for a reference angle, I don't worry about the negatives. I just know it's going to be 3 over 2, because my reference angle is always going to return an angle between 0 and 90 degrees. So find the arc tangent of 1.5, and that gives you 56.3 degrees, approximately. That's the reference angle. So the argument then is going to be 360 degrees minus that because the argument is this larger angle from zero to this terminal side. And so I need to take 360 degrees minus that, which gives me 303.7 degrees. So the argument of Z is 303.7 degrees approximately. Or you could write that in radians if you'd rather it didn't specify which one to use, so I just used degrees here. And then the next problem wants you to write the polar form of Z. Now for the polar form, all of that refers to is basically you take the length times, instead of thinking of it as 2 minus 3i, I think of the length out in front. So polar form in general is the absolute value of Z times the cosine of your argument plus i times the sine of your argument. In general, that's what it's going to be. And so for us, we've already found all this. The absolute value of z was the square root of 13. And so in here, I write it as the cosine of 303.7 degrees plus i times the sine of 303.7 degrees. And you can see if you would multiply all this out, you end up with the rectangular form 2 minus 3i. You take root 13 times the cosine of 303.7 degrees, and it will give you something close to 2 with a little bit of round off error. Then if you take root 13 times the sine of 303.7 degrees, it's going to give you approximately negative 3 with a little bit of round off error. And then Euler's form is directly related to the polar form. It's just an easier way of writing it. It's just e to the i theta times your absolute value of z. So let me go ahead and indicate what Euler's form is here. It's just this, e to the i theta. And so this absolute value of z, again, is square root of 13. And it's just e to the i times theta, which is 303.7 degrees. Again, in, in radian form, you could convert that. That would be what? Times pi divided by 180, about 5.3. So in radians, you could say it's square root of 13 times e raised to the i times 5.3. And then z raised to the minus 1. Well, that just means 1 over z. So that's 1 over 2 minus 3i. And so to calculate this or simplify this, I need to take top and bottom by the complex conjugate 2 plus 3i and then simplify it. So on top, that's just 2 plus 3i. On bottom, it's going to be 4 minus 9i squared. That's 4 plus 9. So it's 2 plus 3i over 13. And that's it for the first page.